Um, got a rather beautiful view out here. <laughs> That's uh, rather nice. I don't know if everybody has a view like that in, in Salt Lake City, but it's great to be here. Um, I want to start with a uh, very brief intellectual biography of who I am and what I'm doing here and what I hope to do um, in, the, uh, in the workshop today. Um, <clears throat> and I'll address uh, the um, art historian folks in a moment um, because mostly, as you'll see, I'm, I am a historian. Um, I have, I'm moving up on a, uh, on a milestone that I think is probably a dubious distinction, but I'm completing my 39th year of teaching at Whittier College, and I'm about to begin my 40th year. So um, it's been a while. So I was trained in, uh, in Chinese history. Um, I'm, I'm a child of the, of the 60s, came out of the anti-war movement. Um, and uh, I was interested in questions about how the communists in China came to, came to power. And so I did my dissertation on, on the China, and it, actually I'll show you some of what that wound up with in the, <laughs> un, uh, unexpectedly in the AP World History uh, exam of a couple of years ago. There are two notorious ones, and I'll show you those. Um, so, um, so I started off doing um, uh, social, economic, political history, 20th century and earl earlier to a certain extent. Um, and after I finished my dissertation and got my first book out, I started doing some other work. And about that time, the, uh, the archives, uh, uh, the imperial archives for the, uh, the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, opened in Beijing. Um, it's a massive archive. We didn't have archival sources before. And so uh, I was uh, looking at a particular kind of, of documents, and you could only have 10 documents a day. Uh, that was the rule. And so if you ran out of those 10, you were basically done for the day. And I had pedaled my bicycle 45 minutes each way to the archive at the Imperial Palace. Um, and if I didn't have any documents, they were gone. I, I was uh, kind of dead for the day. So as a backup, <clears throat> I started to uh, put into my locker um, a set of documents that were uh, rather pretty interesting. They were uh, just lists up on list of rice prices. You want to know the price of rice in China? Ask, <laughs> ask me. Um, but that led me, and, and ultimately I got a database of over a million, uh, million prices of rice over a 60 year period for uh, 60 places in South China. You can do a quite a, little, a lot of interesting stuff with uh, that kind of a, uh, of a price database. And so I continued doing um, uh, economic history, mostly in the 18th century, um, and uh, ultimately moved, that moved into an environmental approach because I needed to figure out how and why rice grew, how, you know, the relationship between deforestation and farming, and you'll get some of that in today's presentation uh, as well. And so I became uh, rather interested in, uh, in environmental history and economic history. And at the same time, a number of other people were doing um, work on other aspects of China's late imperial history. And what we were finding uh, was really pretty interesting. Uh, for example, one of the things that I found, uh, and I wrote up in a, a book that was published in 1998, um, <clears throat> was that through my analysis of these, these prices and price data, um, I concluded two or three things. One is I, I concluded that China's economy was thoroughly market driven. Not only did it have markets for commodities, but it had markets for land, labor, and capital as well. And that if you, if you analyze the working of those markets, there's various ways of, of assessing efficiency. And those markets, using those measures of efficiency, worked more efficiently than markets in France, England, or the United States at the same time. Well, you know, interesting. Um, and at the same time, there were a couple of other colleagues doing work. Uh, James Lee was doing work on... Uh, on China's demographic system and family system, and taking on a Malthusian interpretations that said that uh, other than English um, in the 18th and 19th century, everybody else, especially our uh, brown, yellow, and, and black brothers and sisters out there in different parts of the world, simply could not control their populations. So pop human population out, outpaced 
the ability of the land to sustain the, uh, the number of people leading to Malthusian crises, famine, war, pestilence, all those kinds of things. Uh, what James showed is that, well, no, um, Chinese had all kinds of ways within marriage to limit family size. So an explanation of, uh, of China's very large and growing population in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries cannot be explained by uncontrolled population growth. It has to be explained by some other things. Then we had uh, Dennis Flynn and uh, Arturo Heraldes at the University of Pacific. Uh, Dennis is an uh, economist, and he started asking questions about, about silver and the role of silver in the world economy. And what he and then a couple of other people working on that found is that something on the order of two-thirds, ah, don't do that. <laughs> I'll come back to that. Something on the order of two-thirds of all of the silver taken, stolen, refined, however you want to say that, from the New World, from Potosi in uh, uh, Bolivia, and then later in Mexico, Two-thirds of that wound up in China. And, well, why is that? Right? And so there's, there's a whole set of questions that are, that are being asked about all this. And so Dennis um, had a, uh, a meeting at the University of Pacific in 2000 where a number of us were sitting around uh, thinking about what did all this mean. And basically what it meant is that, is that the, the general story of how the world got to be the way it is um, and I'll characterize that in a moment, uh, had many, many logical flaws. And the usual story of how the world got the way it is, is written in the 19th and throughout much of the 20th century, is encapsulated in William McNeil's book from the early 1960s, The Rise of the West. And the rise of the West is the, uh, is the paradigm that explains how the world got to the way it is, and it then point, pinpoints some of the things that are unique about the West, and we can critique and take apart the West as well. Um, but nearly all, and we look at, and we can look at a number of, of different, different kinds of, of stories of how the modern world got to be the way it is. And nearly all of those uh, have explanations for why Europeans were able to do a number of things, industrialize, have corporations, have mar free markets, have private property, have this, that, or the other thing, um, have cultural values, that's the Weberian argument, uh, that are different and better, they're rational compared to all the other places on Earth uh, that didn't have them. And so we started uh, analyzing this, and uh, turns out that nearly every element or factor that had been um, put forward as an explanation for why the West was wealthier, stronger at the top um, by the 19th and 20th centuries could be found either individually or in collections in other parts of the world, in China, Japan, India, and elsewhere. And this then got put together in uh, around 2000 again by um, a guy by the name of Ken Pomerantz, who uh, made an argument that the world, up until about 1800, uh, the most advanced parts of the world, the uh, China, Japan, India, uh, England, France, Holland, um, when you took a look at it, exhibited surprising similarities in virtually all different kinds of ways that you would want to look at look at them in terms of economic organization, in terms of consumption, in terms of ca state capabilities, all of these things. There's, there's just a significant amount of, um, of commonality. And his argument was basically, um, you can't get a significant difference, that is, European exceptionalism, um, from commonalities. So if all of these other parts of the world had the same thing, why was it Europe? that industrialized and got wealthy first. You know, why not China? What had happened? And so he put all that together in a book called uh, The Great Divergence, which is a very dense, thick book to get through. Um, and I took uh, a lot of these ideas that were being uh, hit around and uh, put them together in what I thought was a more readable version <laughs> of things. <laughs>
that, that, that uh, normal human beings like Kyle and me and, and our students could, uh, I, have a gra I have a graphic of this, uh, into a little book called uh, The Origins of the Modern World, um, which came out, I think, in 2001, 2002, the first edition. Kyle has the second edition. Um, the third edition is, is out now. So um, what we have done over the last 20 years or so, we, I mean, those of us who are scholars of parts of the world other than Europe or North America, um, we've put together a narrative of how the world got to be the way it is that is not based on stories that Europeans tell about themselves. In other words, it's a non-Eurocentric narrative of how the world got to be the way it is. And I'm going to uh, share some of that, some of those findings uh, with you today. Uh, but like, uh, like Kyle, I started teaching uh, world history. I started teaching in 1997, 1998, something like that. And it was really hard. I mean, oh my God, those of you who are doing AP World or AP Art, I mean, this is, this is hard. And I've got the, uh, I'll get, oh, this, I've got to fix this so it doesn't keep going undone here. Um, let's just, I mean, <clears throat> There are learning objectives, there are world areas, there, there's everything here. Um, but the really hard part that I found was that to teach history, um, I, I like to have a narrative, you know, a narrative that kind of makes sense. And it was very, very difficult given the, uh, the structure of nearly all world history texts, and some of them are gigantic things like this. Um, because they're not actually narratives. They could, no, nobody had a narrative as to what the heck was going on. It was like you'd put students on a bus, and you were tourists, and you'd drive to ancient Greece and say, oh, look at those excellent achievements. Then you'd get in the bus, and you'd, you'd, go, to, you'd go to South India and say, oh, look at those laws, and isn't that great, and diversity, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'd move along and just put the students in a bus and just going along visiting and waving at all the achievements. Um, so it's very difficult, I should say it's very difficult, what I discovered, it's very difficult to get a, a narrative that makes a whole lot of sense uh, for the period before 1400, before 1300 or thereabouts, because the world isn't really that interconnected. There are some parts of the world that are, there are some things that uh, um, Victor Lieberman called strange parallels around the world, um, but it, it's hard to come up with a, an interesting narrative. So. The, uh, the, the work that I've done focuses on the early modern to modern, um, and the origins of the modern world leaps in around 1400 or thereabouts um, and goes through the present. Uh, and it does have a narrative. It's a strong narrative. Some people don't like the narrative. Some people react against it. I've been called many things by people who thought that I was uh, challenging. Well, I was challenging. I'm challenging. A number of us are challenging um, <clears throat> existing truisms and truths and upset them. And so some people get, get fairly upset about this to say, what do you mean the um, U.S. isn't exceptional, that Europe isn't on top, that, that it wasn't because of cultural um, values, it wasn't because of racial attributes, it wasn't because of this, it wasn't because of that. So I got threatened with having my tenure taken away. No, I had, that, I, that didn't happen. I, somebody threatened to want to go to my administration say, fire that son of a bitch, you know, he's got <laughs> So the thing is that ideas are, are in fact powerful uh, because they can uh, serve to, to organize and extend additional kinds of research and thinking, and they're powerful because they can generate a tremendous reaction against them. All right. And so I'm going to give you some ideas today that you may have both kinds of, of reactions to.